Okay. So welcome everybody to our sixth seminar on in the algebra particles in quantum theory seminar series. I'm pleased to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Peter Voigt. Peter is a senior lecturer in the mathematics department at Columbia University in New York. Peter completed his PhD at Princeton and later went on to postdoctoral positions at the ITP Stony Brook and the MSRI Berkeley before finally accepting a faculty position at Columbia. Peter is best known for stirring the pot in the high energy physics community several years ago with his book, Not Even Wrong, and his mathematical physics blog, which goes by the same name. And tonight he will tell us about some ideas for unification of his own, uh, what he calls Euclidean twister unification. Now, before we begin, I would like to emphasize that everybody who showed up today is here to learn. And so I hope that everyone feels comfortable enough to raise their hand and ask a question throughout the talk if they have one. If you accidentally ask a silly question, it's not a big deal. You just brush yourself off and try again next time. I would especially like to encourage questions from graduate students, upper level undergraduates and postdocs. Okay, so Peter, anytime you're ready. Okay, okay well, thank, thanks, for, thanks for the invitation. I'm very glad to do this. I'm very glad to have an opportunity to try to, try to, try to speak about this. So, spoken about it a couple of other places before, but and this gave me a chance to kind of rethink um, how, how to explain this and to, to, to try a, a, a different way, which I'm, I, I, I hope will work well. But what I'm going to do is start out with something very basic, just kind of explaining. Um, so for, um, four dimensional geometry is very, very special. And I want to kind of say something about that and about the, the, how spinners work and how um, geometry in four dimensions works in, in a very, very simple way, which and then, um, then go on to explain kind of what um, twister geometry is and how, um, and, and, and what that story is about and what it has to do with spinners. And then there's this gadget, which I really want to advertise, which I'm call, calling the, uh, the twister P1, um, which uh, is, plays a, a crucial role describing a points in space time in, in twister geometry, but and is also kind of miraculously showing up recently in number theory. And uh, so then I want to then get to, uh, but I think is the the thing it took me a very very long time to understand and to realize is that um, people the Minkowski signature and Euclidean signature at quantum field theories are are very very different beasts. I mean they're they're generally treated often just by uh, well you put in a factor of i and your time variable and then it's more or less the same thing. But they're they're quite different. I want to explain that because that's kind of a, a a crucial thing that makes all this work. Um, and then I want to explain about how. Uh, in how the Euclidean and Minkowski signature space times are related in twister geometry, because most explanations of twister geometry just talk about the Minkowski story or maybe the Euclidean story, but rarely about how they're related. Um, and then to, then to get on to the unification ideas, the first part of this idea is um, an idea about how to, in some sense, unify gravity with um, the, the weak interaction theory with the, with, the, with the weak interaction theory. And this is an idea that um, some other people have tried to have tried to do in the past, but I think the this twister point of view I think gives um, lets you lets you do things in a somewhat different way, which I think gets around problems that have um, come up when other people have tried to do this in the past. And then ju just just the, the more general unification idea that includes this gravity and the weak interactions, but also uh, also SU three, and I'll explain how how this how this is supposed to work. Uh, and then finally, what, what, what uh, I want to explain kind of where this kind of project is, what there's still a lot um, kind of missing here from actually having a really full theory that actually does everything I like. And, um, but I kind of want to explain why I still, I'm still uh, so excited about this. And the, um, just, just these the slides, I'll put these online. You can get, if you, if you want to look at these. Uh, and um, also there are two papers out there which have a lot more detail about the topics of this talk. Um, the first one is about the Euclidean twister unification stuff, and the, the second one is about the twister P1 and its uh, relation to various things in geometry and in number theory. Okay, so that's the outline. Okay, so to start, okay, so, so this is something which um, sh should be better known than, than it really is. It took me an embarrassing long time to actually realize this, is that if you want to do four-dimensional geometry, um, especially if, if you are happy with first letting everything, all coordinates be complex, complex the, um, the best thing to do is to really um, define, uh, so identify 
C4 with two by two complex matrices, and he here's one way of doing it, and then take the, uh, take the norm or take, take the norm squared just to be given by taking the determinant. And then, then what the, the really nice thing that happens is that you, you have the, um, the action of the, of the complexified version of the double cover of the SO4 of rotations. Um, you know, tra tra transformations that preserve the length are just given by left or right multiplying by determinant one complex matrices. So, the, but the, uh, so, so this is what we want to do. But what we're interested in is is, is using this, but in um, in but certain kind of sp specific kind of real forms of it. In other words, we don't want to work with C four. We want to work with um, real four dimensional subspaces that, when you complexify, give you give you this. And the uh, so so the three kind of real forms that are easy to work with here are the um, there's there's the thing where you you just let let your complex numbers be real numbers. And then work and work with real um, matrices and real S and real determinant one, um, well, real SL two, and then and then you end up that that um, that inner product is then a, a an indefinite inner product of two two signature. So that's kind of the simplest thing to do if you decide I'm going to use the real numbers, but you can also get um, get Minkowski space time by taking by Instead, by 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 using uh, one SL2C and then taking the other um, SL2C to be given by the inverse adjoint of the uh, of the other. So you so you just have one copy of SL2C. It's kind of kind of like a diagonal copy, but you have to keep track of the adjoints. And and then and in this case, then um, uh, you're 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 then looking at uh, like like skew self adjoint matrices or self adjoint matrices either way. Okay, then the now if if you want to do Euclidean space time, then what you do is you just take um, instead of taking your 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 group elements to be in, in SL two C, you take them to be in um in, in, in SU two. And so so then you get that the, the double cover of the four dimensional rotations is SU two cross SU two. Okay. Okay, and so now we're so we're going to be interested. So we're not going to say anything about the first of these, but we're going to be interested in the relationship between these, um, the, the, the the second two things. Okay, so now, um, so in, now in, in Euclidean signature. So I'm going to take. I'll explain later. I'm going to take Euclidean signature is really the kind of fundamental thing. But in Euclidean signature, instead of working with complex two by two matrices, you can work with quaternions, and so you you. Um, you take your your four real real coordinates are just given by the coefficients of a quaternion. The norm squared is the usual uh, usual usual one. The quaternion times its uh, conjugate, and now and then rotations are, are given by again. It, there's an SU two uh, two copies of SU two, but SU two is just the group of unit length quaternions, also called SP one. So um, so if so, this is really the right way to kind of think about kind of Euclidean geometry in four dimensions. You should, you really should use quaternions and then do rotations by left and right multiplying by, um, by unit quaternions. And, and so one thing that happens when, when you do this, so we've acquired some extra structure that um, more than just in R4, when you do this is that, that there's now a conjugation operation that you can, um, if you just, you know, Take the take the so take the uh, so-called imaginary quaternions, the things proportional to i j k, and change their sign. You have this this conjugation on this space, and so it's it's got it's got more than it's a lot more structure than R four. So I so then the um wait was there a question? Was it was there a question? I, I, yeah, I, 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 a, a quick question. If instead of using the quaternions, if you use the split quaternions, would you have gotten a Minkowski signature? Um, so I, I, I have I have to think about that, and and I, I don't I don't think you get you get that, but I, I'm not I'm not yeah I'm not sure. I thought, yeah, sorry, that's not. A, okay, thank you. I haven't thought about that. Thank you. And so now, but so 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 one other thing to 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 do with with anyway to do with these two by two complex matrices is you can think of them as linear maps from uh, one kind of half spinner space, which I'll call the right half spinner space, to another 
half spinner space to left um, the left-handed spinner half spinner space. So, so 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 the other I think the big advantage of thinking about these four-dimensional vectors as two by two complex matrices is you you, you have this um, anyway you, you have these these spaces of spinners occur, occur very naturally whereas in other approaches to four-dimensional geometry it's very hard to understand where spinners come from okay um, and so and then corresponding to the action on vectors by this left and right multiplication you have action you have two kind of independent actions by by su2 if you like by su2 if you like on the um, on the right and left hand handed spinners so there you have independent um, SU2 is acting on these uh, right and left-handed spinners. So this is di different than in Minkowski space, where the, um, the things are, are connected. Yeah. So I guess here's what I was saying: in the in Euclidean space, these two things are independent SU2 matrices. If you go to Minkowski space, they're SL2C matrices, and one of them is determined in terms of the other. So um, so 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 the behavior of right of kind of these chiral spinners in um, Euclidean space and Minkowski space is, is really is, is very, very different. And this is at the source of uh, a lot of technical problems that people have run into over the years with um, you know, tr trying to, to, you know, to write down a, a Euclidean quantum field theory uh, for, for, for spinner quantum fields. The, um, the problem is just that the, uh, the objects you're dealing with in Euclidean space just are quite, have completely different symmetries than the objects that you're dealing with in, in Minkowski space. Okay, so so one um so that there's a so so one, there's a different way of thinking about the geometry of space time is for, first proposed by Penrose and back in the late '60s, and what it, it um has a lot of there the, 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 this has a, a lot of really nice features, but one of the features that I want to um th to, to use which hasn't been used that much is that it it um provides a it, it, it simultaneously is a complexification of Minkowski and Euclidean space time. And so it gives you an, an arena in which you can, um, can consider analytic continuation between these things. And uh, the other big adva advantage of twister theory is uh, that four dimensional conformal th um, symmetry is, is really very easily understood because um, normally if you try and write down the conformal group in four dimensions, it's, um, it's a little bit of a complicated story, but and what's going to happen um, if you work, especially if you work with the conformal compactification of, of R4 as, as S4 in the Euclidean case, then you're you're going to get a um, and we, the, we'll see that the conformal symmetry comes out in a very in a very simple way. And um, so most thing is if you're trying to learn about twister theory, I think most thing the big the main warning is that um, most of the things that are discussed the physics of it are really are 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 very very much focused on the Minkowski space version, and um, so we're going to be interested more in the Euclidean version. But the and the Euclidean version has been used a lot, but but used a lot mainly in um, in, in more kind of pure mathematical uh, for, for for pure mathematical reasons. So Atia made a lot of use of the uh, Euclidean version of twister theory and the study of instantons, for instance, and many other things. But it um, so you can you can you can get some really nice explanations of the Euclidean version, some really nice explanations of the Minkowski version, but they they're, they're, it's rare to see anything that um, kind of talks about the two things at once. And just some some references if if you're interested in this, the um, for, especially from the physics point of view and, and the Minkowski version, it's uh, the, there's a beautiful textbook by Ward and Wells called Twister Geometry and Field Theory, which um, explains the the Relations, the kind of known relations to the Minkowski space version of physics, and and pretty much anything Penrose has written about twi twisters is kind of a really remarkable thing, that well well worth reading. And there's his book, The Road to Reality, has a chapter at the end on twisters. Okay, so let's see. Um, so let me get. Okay, so now what? So what's twister space? Well, the twister space, in some sense, it's very simple. Twister space is just C four, so it's not um. But, but but we're mainly going to be interested uh, in in working with it to, in understanding the geometry that where, where it's a good idea to remove the projective factor. So you take C four and then you you mod out by the um, by by you know complex multiplication, and you get the um, you know the the, compl the complex lines in 
in, in, into, in, 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 in C4, so the space CP3. Okay, and so maybe maybe just the I read I kind of want to kind of there's several things I wanted to emphasize about twister space by changing the color that so one of the I think the most really compelling things about the, the this twister picture is that a a point of in space time is now going to be a a C two uh, inside C four and so what what this and the C two is exact it's exactly the Kind of fiber of the of the half spinner bundle. So if you in in twister space, if you know what, if you want to know what, how do you describe the um, the, the half spinners at a point? Well, the, the description is kind of purely tautological. A a point is a half spinner field. So that that's kind of what it is. So you don't um so so spinners are really kind of their geometry is kind of completely natural and and completely built into into the subject from from the beginning. But it's also it's built into the subject in a in a chiral way. Um, Left-handed and right-handed spinners are quite different objects, and the points um, you have to kind of make a choice. How am I going to describe points? Am I going to use the right-handed or left-handed spinners? And once once you've made a choice, you have a you have kind of you have a you, you have a kind of a beautiful way of thinking about spinner geometry. But but it is very chiral. And then the um, okay so. Can I ask on, on that note? Yeah. Um, so is there a straightforward way to write down um, a helicity operator uh, when you write things up this way that will act both on the left-handed and the right-handed um, spinners? A helicity operator. I mean, you, you can do this, but the, but it, it's just so what, what's going to happen in, um, in, OK, so in twister space, basically, at, at, at a point, you a point is described by you know by let's say the right-handed spinners, but then um, now the if you want to describe the the left-handed spinners, what you what you need to do is you need to you, you need to, to 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 look at the other two directions. You picked out a C two. You need to kind of pick. You need you need to either either quotient out the the four-dimensional space by the two-dimensional space and look at the quotient C two, or you need to kind of by some by fiat somehow pick a you know some kind of um, complementary C two to be it. So um, and then I mean once you've done that, you, you mean you you do have a. I mean the the, the helicity I mean the helicity operator fits. I mean uh, and, and anyway, I mean, that's the underlying geometry. That then you can you can write down you can write down a, your theory of spinner fields and a, and 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 a um, helicity operators and. Uh, and, and, and such things. I don't know if that does that help. Uh, well, yeah. Basically, I was just asking if there's a. Um, it, it sounded yeah before like you were saying that. Um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't clear to me that you're going to be able to write down a, a helicity operator in the in the usual way where it's got an action both on the left-handed spinners and the right-handed spinners. But perhaps, well, perhaps well, you, you can. can yeah, I, I think the the thing about this point of view, and, and this is something I think I, th I think this has actually always been a problem for Penrose and his and his people that that this is a really really chiral thing that the um and and I would argue that that what this is telling us is that yes the world at a basic fundamental level is really chiral and you um you you know the um your points are right-handed spinners left-handed spinners are you know are, have a very have a different nature and you really have to and and I mean they're they're kind they're 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 kind of there. There's another C two. There's a there, there's there's the other C two. But um, how you think about them and how you work with them is they they really are going to be different objects. And and th this actually gives you a um to my mind this actually gives you some some new freedom to kind of to to, to formulate some kind of inherently chiral. I mean, a lot of the problems you run into of quantum field theory if you try and Work with even like with the electroweak theory is that it, it, it's it's actually you get into all sorts of trouble if you try and write down chiral theories if you try and just separate out one um, yes one you know one chirality this, it this, never wants to be chiral yeah yeah every and and this for in this formalism you maybe you have the you have the opposite problem this this, this thing is inherently chiral <laughs> if you want to if you want to write a non chiral theory and you want the other chirality to behave just like this one now you've got problems. And that these are problems. I mean, Pedro's I think called this the googly problem. But, but, uh, but anyway. So I, I, I but I, I'll argue that that's an advantage, not a disadvantage. 
Okay. Okay. So now, so so the other um, thing about about language here is that uh, instead of thinking about the these C twos and C four, I think it's better to work projectively and think about think about CP ones in um, in PT or in CP three. So these are what algebraic geometers says a kind of complex, um, com you know, complex projective lines in a complex projective three space. And we're gonna. Th this is what we're gonna be thinking about. And so, um, okay. So now the, so so if, if you look at all all the C twos, you get what's called the Gras the Grassmannian, which is uh, this four complex dimensional space of all C twos and C four. Um, but you could you could also think of of these things as as all CP ones in um, in CP three, and then if you um, look at real forms. Like in Euclidean or Minkowski space time, um, and you, you, it's simplest if you, if you take kind of a, a conformally compactified versions of these. And also, there's that this kind of purely real case. You get the Grassmannian of two real planes and four real space. But anyway, all these things give you kind of four real dimensional families of CP ones inside your CP three, and that's the. This is really kind of the nature of space time is that it, it's these. Its points are these CP ones, and the space time is kind of a, is kind of a family of, of the CP ones. Okay, and and then so so that's but anyway so so the first kind of um, ad thing that I that I find very compelling about this is is the that you naturally get chirality, you naturally get spinners, you naturally get chiral spinners, and I think there's also a, a, a beautiful thing which is explained in a lot more detail in any of the. Um, the references I suggested about Minkowski space and twist Minkowski twisters is that this CP1 actually has a physical interpretation. It's the it's the sphere of directions of light rays through a point. So you're characterizing a point by the light rays that go through it. And this CP1 is something very, very, I mean, you open open one eye and, and you're looking at that CP1. So this is not some kind of strange artificial weird mathematical thing you've decided as far from human experience, it's exactly what you see every day. Whereas the, your normal way you think about points is not, it, it is, is much more of a, con, a, a construct. And then there's the other, I think, thing, thing about just the way conformal symmetry works here is very, very nicely that what's gonna happen is that the, um, the conformal groups, well, I'll, I'll explain how these work in the Euclidean and Minkowski space. But they're 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 basically just they're just different real forms of the group SL4C, you know, just acting on C4. So if you, if you want to know how the conformal group acts, you just look at the four by four complex matrices acting on on the twister space on C4 or on CP3, and then there are various kind of there are various kind of real forms, things which if you complexified them would give you SL4C, um, and those are the um, those give you the those real forms give you the conformal groups in a for in Euclidean and Minkowski and uh, and this purely real purely real case, but, but we'll, we'll 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 see some more about, about that later. But anyway, the, so the things in in color is meant to be these are kind of the things I find is kind of aesthetically compelling about the whole idea of twister space. Okay, so we're going to concentrate on Euclidean space time twisters, and and again, it's Euclidean space time, so you want you want to think in terms of quaternions. And so, what you want to do is you want to identify uh, C4 with a with uh, the pairs of quaternions, and use the fact that that your your S4 is just quaternionic projective space. And then the conformal group is just is just two by two of quaternionic matrices of determinant one, and it, it acts transitively on this projective twister space of an S4, but just just through the linear action on on on, on two quaternions. And so, so the picture to have in mind here. So you you have a you, you actually have a five. This is this this thing gives you a vibration from um from at, where what, if you you take a, a point in CP three which is a complex line and then look look you know multiply things in that complex line by any quaternions and that gives you a quaternionic line. So that gives you the map down to HP one or S four and and the fiber is 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 the CP one. So you've got a you, you, the, in, in the Euclidean picture, this CP1 is, is fibered over S4 with, with a, a fiber CP1. And this is going to be kind of the fundamental arena of the theory that I'm, I'm talking about. Normally, you would, um, you would think about, you know, if you try to do quantum field theory in Euclidean space, you're, 
you can think about a, all these structures on S4. The argument here is that you really should be thinking about um, thinking about CP3 and, and this vibration. Okay, and there's a picture. And so then the picture to have in mind again is just kind of that you've got your overall CP3 and then and, and your four dimensional um, Euclidean space time has been compactified as S4, but each point in S4 corresponds to a, a sphere, a CP1 lying, and, and the, uh, the CP3 is just kind of fibered by, fibered by these things. This is a good picture to have in mind. Okay, now the, um, there, there's various ways of thinking about PT from this point of view. One is you can think of it as the projective spin bundle, that if you just, um, if, if, if you think of, if you had your space and you knew what, what the chiral spin bundle was, what the real bundle of real spinners were, then just the, the um, you just take that, that fiber bundle, but where you projectivize, where you just, instead of looking at the C2 fibers, you look at CP1 fibers and that's, that, that's PT. So PT is just the, um, the projective spin bundle, the projective. And there's another, another very important way of thinking about this, which um, is that you can, this, you, you can think of the CP1 fiber over a point, you, you can ac actually identify that with all the possible choices of complex structure and the tangent space at the point. So what's going on in, if, if you're in, if you're doing two dimensional geometry, it's always a good idea to, to try to think of it as um, of your space as you're dealing with as, as possibly a complex space. And, but in two dimensions, there's really only, there's really only kind of one way of identifying C with, um, or maybe with C with R2, or maybe you can change orientations and ha have two ways. But the problem, if you, you know, if you start trying to th think about all, all the kind of glories of kind of Riemann surfaces and holomorphic maps and complex geometry, you, you, you like to do the same thing in R4. But when, one thing you you quickly find is that um, uh, our, is that you know there there is no unique choice of of such a local complex structure on R four, and on spaces like R four there, there's not you know even if you even there, there is that there's a topological obstruction to even continuously choosing making a choice of this so you can't even um, on S four you can't even actually choose. You know, try, try, try and locally choose a, a so-called almost complex structure. It, it's it's not going to work for topological reasons. But the um, but but what what so what the, what this says though is what you can do is instead of thinking of trying to put one complex structure on S four, think about all of them. And if you think about all of them, you get this uh, this bundle where the fiber each of those CP ones is thought of as the um, as parameterizing the the almost complex structures at the tangent space at that point. And, um, and, and, and you get this bundle of all possible complex structures. And even better, this, this bundle um, for S4 actually is, a, is CP3. It, it, it's, a complex, um, it's a complex manifold itself. And, and the point, one, one thing about this is this, this is what um, a lot of what's been, go, what's been done with, with twister theory is to try to generalize this to give, to do this for any Ramanian manifold. And what you find is that, um, you know, you, you, you can do either, you can use either one of these definitions, either use the projective spin bundle or the bundle of complex structures. And then you get a, um, you get something called, a, people call the twister space, the Ramanian four manifold, like, even though it kind of corresponds to the other projective twister space. But um, then if, if the metric, your metric on your Ramanian Four manifold is anti self dual. This 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 new twister space is going to be a complex manifold, and you can use kind of holomorphic methods to study uh, to do Ramanian to, to to study this. And this has been a very powerful technique. And uh, and there's another important generalization that this is that if you um if your manifold is hyperkähler, so this is kind of different than S S four. That not only if you're hyperkähler, not only is there a not only could you, could you pick a, a, a single choice of um, complex structure globally, but you could actually pick um, you can pick a whole sphere of them globally. So the um, the, the, the PT becomes a trivial bundle, um, just the, the manifold cross CP one. So so there's a, there's a long and kind of beautiful hyperkähler story here, which I won't really go into. Okay. So now, okay. So so the 
so 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 one one thing is, so what we have is not just CP3, but we have CP3, which is something with something called a, a real structure. So a real structure is really a lot of ways of thinking about it. But one thing to say is it's just an anti-holomorphic map from space to itself that, that whose square is one. And uh, and then so one one way to to get a real structure is just by um, just by taking conjugation of complex coordinates. So the usual real structure on CP3 is just to take whatever you use while you're doing coordinates and then just take, take rho to be, the, uh, to be the conjugation map on the coordinates. But what's interesting is that there's, there's, a, there's a different one, the so-called twister real structure. And one way to understand where this comes from is that if you identify C4 and H2, then, you know, then multiplying C by, by, by J, you know, is, it's a, it gives you an anti-holomorphic map but it's and it's one that satisfies j squared is equal to minus one on C4 or on H2. And now when you when you projectivize, the minus one becomes a becomes a one. And so this this gives you a um this the fact that you're you have a quaternionic structure actually gives you a, a different kind of real structure, There's a different holomorphic map, which I'll call rho sub twister, but it's something which squares to one on CP3. And this is actually, and, and, and this gadget, you know, anyway, anyway, I'll, I'll say more about this, okay. Uh, so is so this a, is- Can I ask a quick question? Is there a way of knowing all of the possible real structures that you have available? Um, yeah, there's actually, so they're different. Yeah, I mean, this, the story actually turns out to be that for CP, for CPN, if it's a, um, if, if N is odd, there's always two. There's always the usual one and there's always this one and then this one. If CP, if N is even like CP2, then, then there's only one, there's only the usual one. The complex conjugate. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, so CPNs, it, it, it's always either the usual one or this one, and you only get this one and the an odd for N odd. Thanks. Okay, uh, um, okay. But, 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 but the, so if, if you think about what this map does on CP3, you can and you play with it for a while. You can see that it has no fixed points. There's no so there's no kind of real so so in, in this notion of a real structure, when you have a real structure, you normally say the real points are the ones that are the fixed points for this map. Well, in this in this real structure, there are no fixed points, so there are there are no real points. So this is a kind of a situation kind of naturally studied in by algebraic geometers, and it's a scheme over the real over the reals which. You know, it has point it has complex points, but not real points. But the interesting thing is that it does have, um, it doesn't have any. There's there's no real points, but there are real CP ones. Um, and 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 if you ask what are the CP ones that are left, CP one subspaces of CP three that are left invariant by this twister real structure, it's 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 kind of exactly the four dimensional family of them that that. Parameterized best four, which fibered CP3. So it's exactly the ones that I were, were in that um, in that in that previous that previous picture. So it's a, so, so 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 these are also these are under this this twister real structure. Th these red things are are left invariant. Okay, but the, but there's no there are no points in CP3 that are left in there are no points in CP3 that are left invariant. Um, and then one interesting thing, and, and we'll. Anyway, I guess I'll, I guess I'll say this. Oh, I'll say this. Well, the the other thing is that then what happens on a CP one is that the on the CP one the twister real structure is is just the um, the antipodal map. It takes the one point on the sphere to the opposite point on the sphere. Okay, let's see. Okay, and this yeah, this is what I'm saying here. Um, and so and and I just kind of wor worked out the. The, de the details of this. I don't want to go through this, but it's if you use homogeneous coordinates, then it's just multiplication by J is just this map um, in this uh, kind of standard kind of Z coordinate on about a point in projective space. It's 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 not the conjugation map. It's where you take minus one over the conjugation. Okay, and anyway, so so this this then starts to get into the connection to number theory a little bit. Is that the um, you, you have a re, the real field and the and, and it's um and the complex field and in some sense the real structure gives an action of the Galois group which is Z two on um 
on, on these things. So you're getting a CP1 together with an action of the Galois group. And the, another point of view of, of this is that, you know, besides having the fact that there, there are two, so, so there's there are two kind of re real, real things that in some sense complexify to CP1. It's also true that there's two different four-dimensional algebras over the reals that complexify to the, um, to the two by two complex matrices. There's the real matrices and then there's the quaternions. And uh, if you complexify either one of either one of these, you, you get this. And this is kind of this is kind of the same same story. These are these P1s are, ca are called Brouwer Severi varieties for these algebras um, M2R and, and H. So it's a this is part of a, a kind of a standard story in, uh, um, in, in algebra and algebraic geometry. Okay, so now I want to just quickly say something about the number theory things that I got. I've been very interested in recently, but I, I, this, I really kind of can't, this would be a really a different talk. I just have to kind of just say this very quickly, but just the, um, you know, in, in number theory, for, for each prime, you have an analog of the real numbers, that, that the p-adic numbers, and the, whereas R just has this one field extension, uh, the, the p-adic numbers have lots and lots of different fields ex extensions, but they're, um, but their quadratic field extensions can be understood pretty easily, and they could be understood using exactly the same kind of um, structures that we just talked about in the real case. There, um, and you use the fact that there's two inequivalent um, um, QP forms of the two by two matrices with entries in the quadratic field extension. It's just the the two by two p-adic matrices, and then and then uh, a, a very interesting analog of, of the quaternion algebra. So you have um, for each p you have a whole different uh, you have a, a very nice analog of the um, of the quaternion story and that that's um, so the whole there's a kind of a, a uniform way of thinking about the quaternion story that includes both um, finite primes p and then this so-called infinite prime or, or or Archimedean prime where where you get the real field and then it, then the same story ha happens for the CP one that there's two QP forms of the projective line over, over this field extension. There's the, the one over the kind of Q, Q, QP one, if you like, and then a piatic analog of the, the real, of, of the twister P1 we've been talking about. And anyway, so, th th so, so, so this, th this first part of this is a fairly simple story, which is kind of a simple example that shows up whenever you study class field theory. Um, but, but recently in arithmetic geometry, there's People have been found used for that. There's for each prime. There's a, a very precise analog of the twister P1, but it, it's called the farg fontaine curve, and it, it's an analog of um, Carlos Simpson first studied the this real version, the twister P1, but with a, some extra structure that you you assume you've chosen a point and you have a coordinate z, and then and then you have a c star action of kind of multiplying, you know, that by that coordinate. Um, but then this far quotain curve is, it, it's a very, I, I can't even pretend to try to explain exactly what it is, but it, it's a precise analog for all P of the twister P1. And it's, um, you know, Simpson had used this to the twister P1 to, for reformulating a, a Hodge theory in terms of u equivariant bundles over this twister P1. And people that can now are doing piatic Hodge theory, do it using a kind of Galois, and that should be a extension of that. Um, yes, yeah, so I need needs a bar here. Uh, equivariant vector bundles over 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 the Farg Fontaine curve. And very recently, Farg and Schultz have shown you that they can um, you can understand the uh, local Langlands conjecture in terms of kind of the, the geometric Langlands conjecture on the Farg Fontaine curve. And uh, and presumably the same thing also works for the reals for the for the real local Langlands conjecture. So. Anyway, I think I better get away from this. But okay, now this, this I better really stop. But if you want to, I tried to make up a my understanding of the, the the mapping between these two things that happened for finite p and happened at the reals. But I, it, one problem is I don't understand some of this myself. But I better. I think I, this is really for a different talk. So I'll, I'll I'll leave this. This is this is in the paper that I recently posted in the archive. It's also on the um, these slides that'll be on the you can get on the web. So I think I think I better get okay. I better get back back to what I really back to you. So that was kind of the whole twister P one story, pretty much. This is now we're going to get back to Euclidean twister unification, try to explain it. Okay. 
Can I ask one quick question before you uh, change gears. Um, so this real structure, the second real structure that you that you introduced, um, is it going to have any um, interesting physical uh, implications on your standard model picture? Well, I, I mean, it, it's one. I mean, it, it really is one way. It's built in there that it's. So if somebody just hands you CP3, the question is, okay, what what do I, what extra do I need to get um, Euclidean twisters? Well, what the extra thing you need is exactly that 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 structure, because then you know that. Now having that map on CP3 tells you, picks out the CP1s, it picks out the space-time points, it, it picks out the vibration by CP1s. So it, it's precisely the information. What do you need on top of having CP3 to get Euclidean twister? Okay. okay. So now the um okay, so so now first of all, I won't let me just kind of say that I if you study quantum field theory, you, you, you quickly run into the fact that if you really try to define exactly what it is in the Cassie signature, you run into um, a, lot of, a lot of mathematical problems. And, but in Euclidean signature, it's much more well-defined. And um, just one standard version of this is the, is the path integral. If, you're, if you'd like to think of quantum mechanics in terms of path integrals, you know, integrating over an infinite dimensional space, a phase is really a, a really, really ill-defined thing to be doing, whereas um, you can often make you can often make sense of of this and um, and yeah you know, and if you if you don't believe this go ask any mathematical physicist who's trying to make sense of this and uh, versus this and and also if you actually want to calculate one of the one, this this thing numerically this is I can assure you from having worked a lot as gauge theory this is completely hopeless you can't do this whereas this works very nicely so so I kind of started out life believing that this was actually fundamental, even though this was what physics seemed to be to be about. Okay, and then the other thing to say is that quickly as any quantum field theory textbook, you go and look at the kind of comp comp computations of the propagator, even for a free field, and it and it, it says you're going to take the Fourier transform of uh, over of, of this function over. Um, you're gonna take the Fourier transform of, of, of this fu function, and so you're gonna to have to you're gonna to have to integrate over. Um, oh, you're gonna integrate this over e, and when you do that, you're gonna to have to somehow deal with the fact that you're you've decided to integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity something that's got poles at um at plus or minus um, square root of p squared plus m squared, and so you have to decide what you do. So every quantum field theory has a long kind of song and dance about what are we going to do about those poles. Um, and the, the simple way of understanding what the right answer, how to handle the poles is, is that you should be, um, you should actually be doing the calculation in Euclidean space time and analytically continuing. So you shouldn't be integrating along that, you should be complexifying and not integrating along um, in a, in, in physical time, but integrating in imaginary time, and then and then there'd be a, a plus sign, a plus sign here, and you wouldn't have um, you wouldn't have to worry, wouldn't have to worry. And, and another way of thinking about this is if you ask, um, start looking at what the behavior of the two point function is of the, of the propagator, um, in in a free field theory, what you find is that you know along, along along imaginary time, it's a perfectly well defined, nice, nice very very simple function. It's very very well behaved object, and it's uh, it it also is a is, is a well defined function when 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 you're um when you're space when you're space like so when your time when you're outside the light cone when when t is bigger than than x but but the but but when you're in uh, when you're not space like and you're 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 working with real t then you have you have to define you have, you have to define the um this uh, this two-point function as a hyperfunction, as you have to define it at, at, by taking a limit as you approach the um, approach this real axis from, from, from either direction, and 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 you have to be careful about how how you do that. So the that there really are, you know, even in the simplest case of of of, of free field theory, um, uh, the the, the two-point function or the propagator is is a hyperfunction in in Minkowski space. But in in Euclidean signature, it's just it's a perfect it's a very well behaved function. Okay, okay so then now here's kind of the, the summary I wanted to give of, of of what I've kind of what took me a while to realize about Euclidean versus Minkowski space. Let me kind of 
go through this. So, so one thing to realize is that there's there's a fundamental asymmetry in both theories, but and in the Minkowski space, it's you, ha you have to. There's always a positive energy condition. You want your states to have positive energy. You can't if you you can't allow states to have both positive and negative, and uh, and definitely large negative energy, or or you'll have no vacuum. So you have to decide that one sort one one sign of energy is positive, and then you know the like things things like the Fourier transform of your um, of, of functions like your propagator then are supported on on, on only on, on only one direction in E. And then now if you Fourier transform, what this tells you is that the same condition tells you that in Euclidean space-time, you're working with objects that are, if you think of them as holomorphic, uh, if you work in the whole complex time plane, your your objects are holomorphic on, on the upper half plane. So you have to, there's an inherent asymmetry in the Euclidean picture that says that you have to pick out um, positive uh, imaginary time. Okay. Or, or, or you have to pick out the upper half, the ha upper half plane. And then the, a lot of the, so, and then what you find is that field, field operators in Minkowski space time are operators that satisfy a wave equation. Um, the, when you do, the standard way you define field operators in Euclidean space, um, if you do kind of the same way of trying to get a, canon a canon canonical um, Fox space formalism, you find you 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 end up working with operators that don't satisfy the equation of motion. I mean, another way of saying it is, is there are no. Here you have like the Klein-Gordon equation. It becomes kind of a. Um, and anyway, the 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 the, the Euclidean version of, of the Klein-Gordon equation actually has no solutions, no global solutions. So you can't, yeah. You, Field operators are things which don't satisfy the equation. Their motion, they're always off shell. Field operators in Minkowski space don't don't commute very famously. Um, the field operators in Euclidean do do space do commute, and so the Euclidean theory actually has a it has the statistical mechanical interpretation as a um, because the field operator is just commuting objects. So you can actually think of what's going on as a as, as a statistical mechanical system, which is very very different than Minkowski space. But the thing that I think I hadn't realized so much is that you can't um, in, in 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 Minkowski space you can define the physical state space um, Lorentz covariantly so you can specify in a Lorentz covariant way what energy being positive means um, it's in it's it's in the positive light cone and, or or for for positive angular anyway for angular momentum no for for energy momentum but for if you try to do this in Euclidean space time. There is no way to define the physical state space without breaking SO4. You kind of have to break SO4 because you can't specify, you know, what's positive tau and what's negative tau. That asymmetry just inherently breaks SO4. And if you look at what people do when how they how you work with Euclidean quantum field theories and recover Minkowski quantum field theories, well, if you want to if you want the group, the Lorentz group, to act on your physical states and operators. You know, you, and you want to start with this with a nice rotational group SO four action on Euclidean Fox space. Then you you have to um, you, you have to do something like this. You you, you have to kind of break, break the symmetry and choose one direction and use that to get from SO four to SO three one. So there are there is an SO four invariant Euclidean Fox space theory, but it, you know the the states in it and the operators in it are not physical states or operators. So these were these were the things that took me a while to, to realize, and and then 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 just to say again what I was trying to trying to say here is that you have to um, you really really need if you if you if you write down the Euclidean theory and you and you want to get to a Minkowski space interpretation, you have you you really have to choose really what you mean by by imaginary time. You do have you have to break the SO four symmetry. You have to pick a hyperplane, which is the tau is equal to zero hyperplane, and this will allow you to get from SO four covariance to SO three one covariance. And uh, okay, so so what does this mean in twister geometry? What's the what's the new structure you need on CP three in order to get to Minkowski signature? Well, it's a, this is something that you know, Penrose understood very well. It's that there's the thing that appears. One way of saying it is that there's a a five-dimensional hypersurface which splits PT into two pieces. So let me give you a picture. So what um so one way of thinking of it is down on S4, the thing, the S4 at constant 
imaginary time is zero shares an S3, shares this S3 with Minkowski space. But and if you go back and look at the inverse image of this S3 back up here in CP3, it's a, it's a five-dimensional hypersurface um, fibered by these CP1s. But it, 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 it's this specific structure which you, 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 which you, which you need in, in order to, to, to get a Minkowski space interpretation. I was saying, you know, in order to get a Euclidean space interpretation, you needed that real structure. This, this guy, this, this choice of, uh, um, the, there's some extra structure you need to get Minkowski space interpretation. And this is one way it appears. It appears as this five-dimensional hyperspace. And, okay. Okay. So the, um, and anyway, another way of, of saying this, this is a standard thing that's in all the twister theory books is that you can, um, this is this N5 is the zero set of a non-degenerate 2-2 Hermitian form on C4 and, Minkowski, and so Minkowski space time is the subspace of, you know, of the Grassmannian or of all C2s on which this form is zero. So there, that's, that's the equation for that, that N5. And, um, yeah. and anyway, and, and then this also, the, the subgroup of SL4C that preserves that Hermitian 2-2 form is SU2-2, and that, that's, the, um, that's the Minkowski space conformal group. Okay, and again, and, and, and the other thing to, to, to say is that, um, yeah, so, so the interpretation, again, of those points in Minkowski space is that there, it's the, the, the CP1 is the celestial sphere of light rays to that point, and when two points are light-like separated, the CP1s are going to intersect. Like when they're space-like, then, then the CP1s will be disjoint. So like the S3 is, everything on the S3 is space-like and it's all fibered by the CP1s. But other picture is just this, so that, <clears throat> so if you take Minkowski space and, and you complete, then points in Minkowski space will correspond to, to lines, to CP1s in N5. And if these are, these two things are light-like, they'll intersect. And then if you complexify Minkowski space-time and look at the whole, all of GR24, then you get not just the CP1s in, in N5, but CP1s in, in the other two in, in the rest of PT. So, so this is the, um, anyway, so, 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 so this is the kind of underlying kind of standard story that you'll find in kind of any of the books about twister theory and Minkowski space-time. There's, there's a lot more detail about this, this thing. Okay. Okay, so now let's let's get get to try to get to unification <laughs> quickly. Yeah, and I'm running out of time, but this is gonna again. Again, I'll have to. This gets to be a somewhat complicated. Anyway, let, let me see what I can say about it. But one um, one, one aspect of this idea is that it's part of a, a long history of attempts of by people to try to do general relativity as a gauge theory, um, using the fact that you know Yang Mills gauge theory is is such a success for this for the standard model. So. If you want to formulate GR as a gauge theory, what you can do is you can take the, the bundle of orthonormal frames with a, the group SO31 acting on it. You take a, a connection on this bundle, it's called the spin connection, and, it, it, and, and look, look at its curvature. And, but then you also need not just this, the, the bundle of frames, but you also need the, um, you need, you need the actual frames themselves. So, so not you. Know, so what you have is not just an as not just an SO three arbitrary SO three bundle, but a, um, a frame bundle. So it comes with a canonical one form, often called the E or the or the Feyerbein. So you have so these these one forms E and these connections W W W omega, omega the spin connection are the kind of two fundamental. You can take those as your fundamental variables if you want, and if you do that, you can write down the Palatini form of the action. It's just this, this thing, and then the um, then you get the, by 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 varying um, omega, you show that omega is torsion free, so it's it's the levi chivita connection, and then by varying the, the e's, you, you get um, the, the Einstein equations for the um, you know written in terms of the of the Feyerbeins instead of in, in, in but you can also if you knowing the Feyerbeins is, is the same as knowing the metric, so you can go back and forth between the Feyerbeins and the metric. So this is a standard story. But now, if you work in Euclidean spacetime, then you know the uh, spin four, four breaks up into two SU two. So your um, your yeah, your 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 connection now takes that takes you know take 
it's a one form, but it, you, you can now separately look at the right and left handed pieces of it. And what, what's a really remarkable thing that I, I hadn't really realized before, and I guess the people who do loop quantum gravity know this very, very well, is that you, um, and this is the story of Ashtakar variables, is that you can, um, to get Einstein's equations, you actually only need to, to look at one, one component of this. If you look at one, one component and just call it omega sub r and, and just look at its curvature, um, that together with the, um, the torsion free condition actually uh, gives, 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 you, gives you the Einstein equation. So you, you can actually get the Einstein equations just totally paying no attention at all to what's going on with, with the left, left handed spinners in, in Euclidean space time. And so all of these things act on, on the right-handed spinners, not on the left-handed spinners. You can, you can get Einstein's equation. So it's not, um, uh, again, it's what we were talking about a bit earlier that the, uh, it's a very chiral story, but it, it, um, it, it does actually give you the full Einstein equations. But again, you, but this is in Euclidean space time. And so anyway, the, there's a long story about, about doing this and the way Ashtakar does this in the Hamiltonian formalism, this, Omega sub r is a configuration variable on a space like hypersurface. And then you have to define your phase space and worry about constraints. But the, um, and, and, and instead of the dynamics being the Yang-Mills dynamics, they, they come from all of the dynamics then comes from constraints coming from diffeomorphism invariants. But the, uh, the problem, let's see, I wanna say this. The, the, the problem that you run into in the standard way of doing this with Ashtakar is that it, is that your 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 people have always been trying to trying to do this for SO31 because this is this is really the physical this is what's supposed to give you physical GR. This this doesn't give you this is giving you something else. This is giving you some kind of Euclidean version of GR, which doesn't have any kind of <laughs> which there are many, many problems about how how that could possibly be related related to the um, uh, Lorentz version of, of, of GR. And so and, but if you wanna try and work with this idea for SO31, you have to kind of work with the complexified variables. And this, this leads to uh, long stories, which you, which you can read about and um, kind of, which are at the base of a lot of the, the work on loop quantum gravity. Okay, so, and so people have tried to do, to say, okay, well, let, let's just take the SU, you know, let's, let, let's take one of these SU2s to be the, um, the one that gives us gravity and the other SU2, the internal symmetry of the Yang-Mills theory, the weak interactions. And I'm proposing you know, essentially the same thing, but with some, some different features. One, so one problem that people run into when they try and, and do this has always been that it's very, they're trying to do this in, Euclid, in Minkowski space where these really aren't independent things. And so that gets very confusing very quickly. Um, so I'm saying, I don't care about, I mean, I'm, I only care about Minkowski space at the end of the day when we're gonna analytically continue back. I'm gonna write down my theory in Euclidean space. So, so these, these really are different, they really are different things. Um, and so this is the philosophy I'm gonna pursue. And, and then I'm, the other thing, and this I think is the thing which may be really new here is, is, to, is to, really, to really realize that, okay, if I'm gonna work in Euclidean space time theory, one component of the fear bind, the thing that's pointing in the imaginary time direction really is a distinguished thing. That this has to be treated completely differently. That if you wanted to find states, I mean, you, you actually, the, 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 this is not gonna behave like, like the other three. You have to, um, so you have kind of a, a distinguished um, new degree of freedom, which is the fear bind pointing in the imaginary time direction. Anyway, and the, the, the argument is gonna be since I'm starting to run out of time. The argument is going to be the punchline is going to be that that really is is what that behaves like the Higgs field, so that that the uh, the spontaneous symmetry breaking of SU two that you see in the real world is exactly due to the the fact that um, if you're in Euclidean quantum field theory and you want to get back to Minkowski, you have to break SO four. Yeah, so yeah, and so you have to break that SU two. Okay, so then the um and and the the uh, so, so the other part of the idea is, is to, to work with twister geometry and to work up, not just on the space S4 space, but, but to, uh, to move the problem up to PT, up to the uh, projective twister space. And, um, and, and then, you can, then you can actually get this idea to, to work. And here, I, I think 
yeah, th th this starts to become a, a little bit, bit intricate and it, it's worked out in great detail in this paper and I'm running out of time. So I'm afraid I'm gonna have to just quickly tell you that, 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 what, that that's the basic idea is to work, to, to do this, gra this grab a weak unification up on twister space and, and work with that SU2 up there. And, um, and so that, that, the, that SU2, that internal symmetry is gonna kind of move within the SO4 as you move, as you move up and down the fiber. And, you, and, and that's kind of part of the challenge of, of, of figuring out a right, the, the correct formalism to kind of write, write down the, this idea and write down the standard story up on PT and, and, and to, to get this to happen. So, and, and, I, and I, yeah. I can ask a quick question. So, um, so here's uh, so you've got a U two here, and the uh, the U one um, it should really just be a piece of the hypercharge, right? It's not the full hypercharge operator uh, because if the full hypercharge operator is going to have to distinguish between quarks and leptons, and uh, this SO four it does that information isn't contained in that in this SO four. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll get to that that in a minute, but 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 yeah, but but the basic idea is is the the electroweak U two is the subset, you know, if, if you think of these fibers as parameterizing complex structures, well, the, 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 that the U2 is the, exactly the U2 that commutes with the complex structure. The complex structure determines a U2 in SO4. It's exactly that one. And, um, Great. Okay. But the, I'm just saying that the, the U1 though, so, the, so there's a U2 subgroup that you're getting out of SO4 and the U2 is equal to SU2 cross U1. And the U1, you're, you're uh, trying to identify that with hypercharge, right? weak hypercharge. But yeah. it, all I'm saying is that that's only a piece of, the, of weak hypercharge uh, because weak hypercharge is going yeah. to need to distinguish between quarks and leptons and that information isn't here in this SO4. Right, yeah, so I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But, but yeah, but, 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 but the, the main point here is just that that U1, so, so, so that SU2 doesn't change, the SU2 doesn't change as you move up and down the fiber. The problem is that that, U, that hypercharge U1 does move. It, it, um, it, it, it's, it, it, it's not, that U1 is no longer a U1 defined on the base space on S4, it's a U1 defined on CP3. Okay, okay. but it's okay. still not going to distinguish between quarks and leptons. Yeah, let me, I gotta get to, let, okay. let, let me try, let me try, yeah, so let me, let me get to that, to that. That's, exact, that's the next thing, because quark, so this is the electroweak theory. And then, um, okay. And then, just the, the the thing I just wanted to to, to claim is that if you ask, okay, what the, how does the imaginary time direction um, transform under this U two? Well, it tra transforms under this U two just like a Higgs field. That's the claim, anyway. Okay. So, so this is this is all just the electroweak theory, and, and some this is a way of getting electroweak theory. And and but I'm just but there's kind of part of the story which is living up on PT, which is a problem for me about what to do, how how to work with it. Okay, but now, but if you do work up on PT, so again, so a, a point is a com in PT is a complex line in C4. Well, and, and it picks out that U1 that we're talking about. But at the same time, there's also, uh, there's also the quotient space. There's the, there's the um, you know, and the, there's the other C3s. And you can think of it as, as the quotient of the C4 mod that complex line. And or you can use the standard the standard emission form in C four and um, look, look look at the group and, and anyway and, and, and use that to specify the thing. But e either way you, you do this, you're going to end up with a um, you, you're going to get a, a, a U three which now which includes that U one. So so this is where the U, where the um, again it's the same U one and that U three, but it's the this is where the SU SU three is supposed to come from. But again, this whole construction is taking place up on PT, which is kind of kind of very problematic. If I want to kind of how to how to explain the relationship between this and and the usual theory. So this um can I can I interrupt again? Uh, so this U one uh, that you have here, uh, which comes along with SU three inside U three, um this U one that you have, um it looks like it's likely to be a B minus L symmetry. Is that true? Well, let, let me show you here. I mean, actually, right, um, okay. Let me just say, yeah. So, so one one way of thinking about this is we've um. Well, and anyway, so the points a, a point in S four gives you. So we, we've identified C four and C and H two, and the point on S four gives you decomposes the H two into two H's, and the point on CP three decomposes the C four into a C three and a C. But anyway, this is 
the geometry, but I think now I want to get to what you, um, yeah, so this is what, this is just what I was, was saying. And so, I mean, this kind of gives you the right kind of groups that, that you would like, but they're, that they're in an unusual place and there's none. Okay. But the question now, is if the, if the charges are. Yeah, going here, to here we go. To... So this is, I think, is again. So now, yeah. what, what, how are you, how, in this picture, okay, I, I have a, a splitting between the two H's and between the C3 and C. And if I take, so, so if, if I look just at kind of linear maps from C4 to itself, if you like, or if you like just four by four complex matrices, bro broke it with, you know, broken up on one side by the, the C3 is C splitting and the other side by the, the quaternionic splitting, then I get, it decomposes this way. And I can, I can then start asking, you know, what, what does it, how does that U1 act on these things? And what you get, um, yes. Yeah, so, so, so I think the um, these numbers, the, the lower numbers are they are are how the U one acts. So that they're the weak hypercharge. So are, are you saying that the the U one that's coming from the U the U three is the same U one as the U as the U two that's coming from inside the SO four? Um, it looks to me like they should be they should be two separate U ones. No, it's the same. It's the same, same, same one. Yeah. So, so it's it, it, it's acting here. Okay. I mean, I, yeah. I see. Well, okay. The point is I, I have to make. I have it just acting on on C here at, in, in the standard way. And I, I. But. Well, yeah. You you have an overall U one, but you want. Yeah. I, I guess the thing is, I want. I want to take SU four mod. I should write this out differently. Yeah. The, 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 there's an overall U1 which which act which acts with the same weight on everything. So I, I want the overall weight. I don't want to act with U4. I want to act with the SU4. So I want the the overall weight to be for it to be trivial. And so I have to make it one third on the on the C3 and 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 the opposite sign on, on these guys. So so another way of saying it is I want this is a U1. This has this this is this U1 has to be inside SU4. So that looks like a B minus L on the on the left hand side, um, and then on on the right hand side, there's a, a U one coming from from a, the U two that's inside your SO four. It, okay. it looks it looks to me like there's there's two separate U one charges going on a B minus L and then a um, another another one with, within this U uh, two. When you and then you can take different linear combinations. One should uh, you, one way to separate them is one should be a B minus L and the other one should give you um, a weak hypercharge. That, that maybe I mean you, you're you're right there. I mean I, I guess the, I, I have to think about it about about how, I mean just, I'm just saying the, the way I think about it is just that there's an overall there's an overall U four acting on, on, on this thing. So so CP three is is U four mod U one cross U three, but I want to think. No, but 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 yeah, I, there, there's an overall overall U one, but I want it to be, I want things that are in that um. Is it S U four? It's S U four over U three. No, it, it's U four over U one cross U three. So in the, in that sense, there's two U ones there, but but one of them is kind of trivial. Isn't it spin six? Sorry, <laughs> sorry for being a pain. Isn't it spin six over U three? Yeah, yeah. Which, which is which is S U four. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that that's right. But I'm so, but you can also think of it as U four, as U four mod a U one that's acting on on the C and a U three that's acting on the C three. But 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 there's then you have a U one top and bottom which you can cancel. I see. Okay. So 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 that's one from my point of view. Yeah, those are the two U ones. But one of them is just the, the overall U one that I don't. It's going to cancel. But I, I think maybe we should talk about this more. I mean, I, I think because um, part of the problem is I. The, the language you're, you're trying to think about it in, I haven't thought about it, I don't think, but like, I haven't thought about, and I, I should think about this, but th th there, there are definitely some funny things going on here with how I'm getting this C3 and I'm, I'm willing to believe that there's, but anyway, but, but th this, this calculation should, I do actually believe that this actually makes sense, but you have to, I have to see what it says in your language. And, and I, there I is think just it, one U1. I think it, it is possible to get those charges. It just seems to me like there might be an extra U1 uh, floating in there corresponding to a B minus L. Yeah, that's possible. Anyway. But anyway, so this, so this, so this, the, 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 this is one way, I mean, I think one kind of remarkable thing in this is, is you get, you know, a fairly simple, just kind of four by four complex matrices just give you a, 
anyway, give you, give you a generation. Okay. okay, so now let me get to the end here. And this is, so, so one, so, so now let me kind of move on from what I understand to, to what I'm having trouble with. And so one thing about this is this, this only kind of explains why there's one generation. And also I may be doing something funny with the SU3, which um, is maybe not, not quite the right thing to do. Um, but what, what one, and, and I, I'm actually not using uh, an, an, an obvious structure, which I probably should be using, which is um, to think about, you know, the, the, the S7, um, because S seven has these kind of beautiful, all these beautiful geometry. It's spin eight mod spin seven. It's spin seven mod G two. I'm I'm using a lot spin six mod S U three, and I'm also using a lot spin five mod S P one, which is spin five is 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 um yeah yeah. And anyway, so 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 these two I'm using. This is the quaternionic. This is the complex. This is the real. But there's also the octonionic story, and I'm not doing anything at all with that. And it, it's also very much occurred to me just recently that, and I guess I always realize that I've gotten all this mileage here out of thinking of C2 as the quaternions. And now, and I've been working with H2 with, with two quaternions. So shouldn't I really be thinking about the uh, pairs of quaternions as octonions? And um, this is what I, I hope one of you, people, people who know more about octonions, like like you will we'll, we'll kind of think help me think thinking about this or we'll think about this and and see see if you can come up with something because it 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 it, it looks like there's an octonionic picture there's some this whole beautiful picture of the twister p1 and brower severi and everything um is there you know the problem you know there, there's no kind of standard analog of that whole story for the octonians but people who know about octonians may know what the right what the right gadget is I might, I might actually say that um, there, um, there might already be a, a, an entry point for the octonions in what you've already, what you already have with the CP3 um, when it's expressed as spin six over U3. Um, in a, um, some work that I did together with Mia Hughes recently, we found that uh, an octonionic complex structure, when we wrote down our model, uh, in the context of our model, uh, we started with the Petit Salon model, and so the spin six is automatically part of that gauge group. Yeah. And we found that an octonionic, um, an octonionic complex structure can be used to, to break um, this uh, spin six down to U3, which is, you know, it obviously corresponds to CP3. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's the same thing here, yeah. Yeah, or, yeah, or yeah, okay. And anyway, I, yeah, I would love to talk to you more about, about the, uh, these octonionic aspects of it. That, that, this, that's, that's an aspect of algebra and geometry I've just never really um, thought, thought much about. It, it looks like uh, Wolfgang has a question. Would you, do you mind fielding? Sure, sure. Okay. Wolfgang? Hello? Hi, yes. uh, uh, let me, I, I'm using my phone, so things may not okay, uh, work out uh, uh, properly. I have a question on the, uh, so I jo joined in, uh, uh, perhaps only a bit later, but um, so I have a question on the slide on the electroweak and gravity uh, connection. And uh, my, my question is the following. So as far as I understand, the idea is that now the, um, the fear binds, the tetrads, as carry somehow one part of the, or carry the electroweak symmetry. So in a way they are charged under the electroweak. So would it mean that we would be now allowed to have uh, like terms in the Lagrangian that we would otherwise not have like contractions of uh, uh, fields that are charged under electroweak symmetry contracted with some Fearbind fields, for instance. And or, or are there other, or what are the other than pr other principles or that, um, that tell us what uh, what terms should appear and uh, how, uh, how 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 to construct it or how to find the dynamics, or yeah. Well, I, I, I should say exactly this is kind of partly where I've you know in some sense got stuck and decided to write up where what I had is that you know exactly at this kind of point that you're 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 asking about is yeah you know, how how do you um 
I mean, there are various ways of saying what the problem is, but the yeah, you, you, you have to, but but you're you're pointing out to exactly one one confusing thing here is that the, the fear by you want well the the time like fear by the time like fear by or the imaginary time like fear by and I'm claiming is the Higgs field and that and that um, that actually I can show behaves under U two the way it should the the space like fear binds are more of a problem because what you want you want those conventionally they should they should just be um, I mean, you you want the, you, you want those to 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 not depend upon on, on that internal U two you you want those things to to just uh, um, kind, kind of rotate. Yeah. You want to be able to look at the kind of standard rotations of three dimensional space, and and those fear binds should behave correctly under that. So mm. there there is a confusing thing going on there, which and, and it's part of the confusion that I'm working up on. Yeah, I'm working up on projective twister space, so I've got there's some different degrees of there's some different degrees of freedom there, and um, yeah, I I, I, sh I shouldn't but perhaps another comment. What is somehow uh, I mean using a purely self-dual theory, this a purely is other, a, a, a self-dual action for GR, for instance. self -dual, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then these other indi indices are, are somehow hidden in the, yeah. in the right? So yeah. perhaps that is a, a way to think of it, that uh, in the actual action that underpins, underlies gravity, we don't see this, uh, the, the, uh, see this other SU2 or the, uh, um, we, we don't see it because the action is, is uh, self, self tour. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the, yeah. Anyway, this is the standard story about this twister stuff that you, it, it's easy, but you naturally get self dual, self dual Yang Mills, or you naturally get self dual um, Einstein, or, yeah, and, and that's, um, which is different, which is something somewhat different than you want, but but yeah, I, I'm I'm afraid that the answer to your question is just that yeah, I, I think there's a lot of mm. yeah, I'm I've kind of just started to think about such issues, and and I, I think it, this kind of opens up all sorts of questions, and but also some new possibilities, also some potential problems, but I, I don't have my, really anything to say about them right now. So, but I think yep. you know, I think you, thank, you are seeing exactly where where, where the interesting questions that remain are. Yeah. yeah. Thank. Uh, thanks for the. For the answer and uh, nice, nice talk. Okay, so, let me just quick, quickly then finish. I'm getting it's late. Um, where were we? Okay, the Octonians, and then this just this is what I've just kind of several times said that the the, the problem is that I really you really want a formalism that's on twister space formalism, not a not an S four formalism, and the um. The, anyway, there, 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 there's a, a normal story ab about how self-dual connections or anti-self-dual connections become holomorphic things, and but you want you want that's not quite what you want, and also you hear the standard Penrose Ward thing. You, there, you're talking about connections on an arbitrary G bundle on S4. The bundles I'm working with are not arbitrary G bundles for arbitrary G. There, there are certain very very specific. Um, Bundles, you know, with, with certain very specific groups, which come from the geometry of the CP3, and so, so I'm I'm not, I'm in a I'm in a different context than Penrose Ward, and um, again, I'm I'm just kind of been starting to think about what, how do things, you know, what what happens to the Penrose Ward story in this context, and what can you do that's new and different in this context? Okay, and then um, and again, and, and this is kind of what you're asking about is uh, you know, what a and then the other problems is you know so so what what dy dynamics I got, am I going to give these um, these objects and you know am I going to solve any of the problems of GR this way I don't know okay anyway okay then th this this is then the last slide just is just kind of this is just the advertisement um, the advertisement is just that what I what I really like about this picture that these spinners are tautological objects that this actually tells you how to analytically continue between Minkowski and Houdini in space time. It tells you how to analytically continue spinners, which is something which otherwise is very, very hard to figure out what that means. Um, you, you see exactly the symmetry groups of the standard model occurring in, in this geometry. Um, the a generation of standard model fermions is, look, you know, shows up as a fairly simple way. Um, you, you can get a, 
a, a different sort of chiral formulation of gravity, but but even more, it's it's unified with the standard model ones, and um, conformal symmetry is built into the picture in a fundamental way. And I'm also very very fond of this idea that you know that the uh, in this picture, the way you describe a point in space time is exactly the arc the Archimedean point analog of what's going on in number theory, where, where how what number how number theorists are describing you know the finite primes in their latest work in number theory. So, 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 so that, that's it. I think I better, better stop there. Thank you so much, Peter, for a very interesting talk. Um, do you have any, uh, any more energy for a couple more questions? It looks like oh, sure, people sure. have their hands up. Okay. Um, so Wolfgang, you've got your hand up. Are you, uh, are you just, do you still have your hand up from previously or I've, un I've unmuted you? No, I think that was me, but he still has his hand up from, from when he was speaking before. Okay, so to Ginger, you've got a question. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you for a very nice and enjoyable talk. So I have a question uh, regarding SU2 right-handed gravity. So suppose uh, I think of this as a Young Mills theory, which I want to quantize similarly to how I would have quantized electroweak. I would expect that the corresponding gauge bosons will be spin one right-handed analogs of the W bosons rather than a spin to graviton. So in such a theory, I don't actually don't expect a spin to graviton, which for me is a very good thing, because I think of a gravity actually as an emergent classical theory. What is your thinking? Would you see gravitons here with the SU2R gravity if you quantize it? Well, the, I, mean, the, 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 I mean, the the different thing about about gravity than about um, Yang-Mills theory is that you have the you have the Feerbein field, so it, it, so you have these extra fields. So it, it's not just a, I mean, in, in, in Yang Mills theory, you know, your your basic variables are just the um, these spin one connections, if you like. In the um, when you try and do gravity, you've got both, yeah, yeah. Your your your, your dynamical variables are both the spin connection with, and the um, but also but also and the Feerbeins. And you have a huge amount of gauge symmetry. So when you you know use the constraints and get get rid of the gauge, the gauge degrees of freedom. You mean that then what then what you have left over are these um, you know are these spin two these physical spin two degrees of freedom. But but they they're really kind of naturally built out of the fear binds, which is something that you didn't have in Yang Mills theory. So but, how but is SU two L different from SU two R? What, what? What's the, really the difference between the SU2L weak force and the SU2R, which you are saying is gravity? To me, the you know they look very similar. Yeah. And in actually, in the oh. in the in the octonion language, you know, if you look at the maximal subgroups of G2, one of them is a U3 like SU3 cross U1. The other is a SO4, which is really SU2 cross SU2. So I, um, yeah. well, it seems, I, I, yeah, I mean, please go ahead. You, you, you clearly have to have to give gravity and Yang Mills different dynamics. And, and the, um, in, in the, um, so, so the way you're gonna, you have to treat SU2 left is gonna be, you, you don't want the physical, the fear binds, which give you kind of spatial geometry. You, you want, you don't want those to be part of the story. And you just want it, you want just the standard, um, Yang Mills action, which 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 doesn't involve the fear binds at all, and only involves the uh, the SU two left um, connection. But when you do gravity, you know you you really want the fear binds. Also, you want the fear binds and the uh, the SU two R spin connection. You want both of those. And but so the, suppose suppose I did not know Einstein equations, metric tensor and uh, spin two fields. I only knew SU2R. What would I have done? Uh, you know, why would I expect to try to get GR out of it? Well, I mean, that, that's exactly what, what that, the, the Palatini action that I wrote down, you can just, just you, you write that down for, j just for the right-handed spin connection and, you know, find the equations of motion, you'll get Einstein's equations. But but you're going to get Einstein's equations by varying varying the fear, the fear bind fields, not by varying the uh, the spin connection. 
varying the spin connection is just going to yeah. tell it is going to you can use that to impose torsion free. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, um, Howard has a question here. I'll unmute you. Go ahead, Howard. Yes, this is um, really sort of um, a much more trivial question. But since I'm going to go back and look at the slides, there was one point I was a little confused on. I think it's on the slide before um, your summary slide. Uh, if we could go back to that. So maybe just the previous slide. This one? Is this it? Uh, well, no. It, so it, I think it involved. Oh, this is it. Yes. Yeah. So you said um, fundamental degrees of freedom now live on points of PT, which one can think of as light rays rather than on points of space time. Yeah. Um, so, okay. The points of space time you said were, um, were like um, celestial spheres, essentially di yeah. light ray directions. Was yeah. that correct? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think I'm being, I'm, 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 what I'm saying is not, yeah, to really say this correctly, I, I really, re really strongly recommend you, you go, go, you know, find something written by somebody, by Penrose or something, who really explains. He, he's very, very focused on on exactly getting on that exactly the relationship between this geometry and the geometry mm -hmm. of light rays. I, I, I'm kind of um, part part of my problem is that I, I, I really only looks to me like I really just want to think about how to write down a theory in Euclidean space-time. And in Euclidean space-time, there are no light rays, right? <laughs> I can't, uh, so I, I have to, um, yeah, so, so, so to get the relationship, to get kind of a non-trivial light cone and light rays, you have to go to the Minkowski story. And um, then there's a, I mean, I, I tried to kind of draw some pictures and say a little bit of the geometry, but there's, there's a bit, anyway, the, 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 it's a bit more of a complicated story than, than so I, I'm, I'm kind of sleezing over some compl some complexities okay. here, which I so yeah so so it I, has I, to I, involve analytic continuation to see no it, it's just yeah. how does it work the um if you if you look at the twister theory literature what you'll find is is that to, so points in how does it go points in PT correspond to alpha what they call it alpha there's a story about alpha planes and beta planes and okay. yeah and and I haven't um. But 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 you're 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 probably maybe one way of saying what the underlying problem is. The underlying problem is that things really, the twister th theory really naturally wants to be a, a story about complex geometry. Mm -hmm. So you really want to relate points on anyway you, anyway you you really want to think about things happening in complex four dimensions. You want to look at mm -hmm. complex two planes or complex lines and. You want to do that. So, but if you want to talk about something like a light ray, something which is kind of a something that's happening just in Minkowski space, you have to kind of think about how to relate that to these complex two planes and complex line. And mm -hmm. and there, there's a little bit you have to do a little bit of work to get that right. And I, I I I that's kind of the one piece. That's the one piece of geometry which I didn't draw a picture of, which I don't really explain here. And partly because Penrose draws all sorts of beautiful diagrams of it in his own work. So. Well, I have his book and I have some blue London mathematical reviews thing about right. twisters, which I forget so who wrote it, but. So it's in there, but I, but Penrose has some really nice, um, yeah, and, and, and from what I remember, the, the, ch the chapter on twister theory and road reality is very, um, is clear, but, uh, and, and he, he just many, many times has kind of writ, writ, written, written this out. There's also this, um, the book by Ward and Wells also has a very, very extensive discussion of this and a lot of, um, but it, um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I had, I didn't really, I, I don't know. That's one part of the story I really didn't give you a, a decent explanation of. Here. Well, thanks. There's a lot to look into. So. Does anybody else have any more questions? Oh, looks like Tajinder might have one more here. It's a quick general question again. So this is a very nice route to unification. Uh, suppose we also now ask there are these 26 free parameters to the standard model. How am I going to fix them? Do you see some light? <laughs> um, where will that come from? Well, m most of the parameters are, are Yukawa's. Most of them are, are the, telling you the cu coupling between the Higgs field and the, um, 
and 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 the spinner and the spinner fields. Uh, so I mean, one one thing that I clear that you know that, that I I don't have anything to say at this point, which would, would which would be to start answering questions like that would be to really write down some so, you know, to, to to do some to to say something interesting about the dynamics of it, saying just saying that the Higgs field is the direction, um, the imaginary time direction is all well and good, but I, I haven't really said anything interesting about the dy the dynamics of this, how to really kind of implement that in a an interesting dynamical law in which that's the case, and 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 um, and and yeah, and you 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 can kind of just write down this, what the standard. Yeah, I mean, all, all I have right now is that is that I think that this more or less matches this kind of standard story with, with all of its standard problems of not knowing. You can write down these parameters of Lagrangian, but not having an idea where they come from. I mean, mm. what I what I would like, what I would hope for, is that if the um, if I actually understand better how, you know, why that why this really gives you something different than the standard model. Why looking at at something on CP3 instead of on S4 doesn't just give you something mathematically equivalent to the standard model, but something with something that's at least subtly different. And then that um, that that would be kind of the huge payoff if 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 that. If you can somehow do that, so I'm. I, I, but I guess I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly. You, I'm, I'm first just trying to understand I, how to get the standard model out of this, and then to see if I get something different. That would be great. What I found useful was suppose we start making a coordinate geometry, say not with real numbers or complex numbers, but with quaternions or octonions. Use them as coordinates for a more like something like a square root of Minkowski space time, but labeled by quaternions or octonions, then the algebra of the coordinate system itself uh, starts putting constraints on these free parameters. When you start defining the states using, you know, uh, Clifford algebras made from quaternions or octonions. So uh, yeah. to uh, use these division algebras as coordinates for a yeah. new, what you could call a quantum Riemann geometry. So maybe there's something in the twister language. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, it's certainly very fundamental here that, you know, the ve vectors in R4 are quaternion. So the, the Higgs field is, yeah, is, is a, in some sense, a, is a quaternionic valued field. And um, right. whether, what, whether you can use that in some interesting way, I, I don't know yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it looks like there aren't any uh, further questions. Now might be a good time to close things off. Um, so I want to say thank you so much to Peter for such a, um, an interesting and uh, thought-provoking talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Okay, well, th thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you to everybody for your questions uh, and your enthusiasm. Um, so. Uh, I should mention that um, our next speaker is Andreas Troutner uh, from the Max Planck Institute. Uh, on the 28th of February, Andreas will be telling us about what he calls symmetries of symmetries in particle physics. Um, so thanks again to everybody for showing up. Uh, thanks to Peter for a wonderful talk. And um, I hope to see everybody again in two weeks. Okay, yeah, thank you. Bye now.